Radio 2 presents Lloyd Cole knew my father. Hello, great to be back in Cleveland. My name is Andrew Collins. My name is Stuart McConey. And my name is David Quantic. And we are three maverick butlers from the House of Rock. <laughs> Filling the beans on the intrigues therein with the assistance of real-life actress Amelia Bulmore. Just because I'm a woman, you assume I'm not interested in music. All right, then. Name all three of the Beatles. <laughs> I was once mistaken for a member of early 90s indie duo Carter the Unstoppable Sex Machine. <laughs> I know. It was the hat. I used to be a teacher, and I was once teaching a class about civic responsibility and the benefits of staying on at school and doing your A-levels when a secretary came in and said the enemy wanted me to go to Seattle to interview in excess. So I resigned on the spot and walked out. <laughs> I was once challenged to a fist fight by Paul Weller from the Style Council in the middle of Regent's Park. And I was once criticised by fat man Meatloaf for not realising that the story he had told me was ironic. <laughs> Of course, he was right, because, like Andrew and Stuart, I am a music journalist. And this week, like a woman in a Picasso painting, we're going to take a crazy sideways look at live music. Let us first then travel back to the NME, or New Musical Express, where the three of us met in the late 80s on the payroll of the same publisher, IPC. R. It was a massive publishing house. As well as the NME, they published New Scientist, Horse and Hound, Marie Claire, Cajun Avery Bird, that famous New Orleans magazine, <laughs> and Macrame Monthly, incorporating What Not. <laughs> and all these publications had computers, scanners, faxes, hover jetpacks, everything you could need. It was the cutting edge of publishing technology. Because NME sold hundreds of thousands of copies as it was, i.e. printed on Isal toilet paper with a potato, <laughs> they never spent any money on it. For instance, this is how the famous NME's weekly gig guide was put together. Every individual entry was written longhand on a separate sheet of A4 paper. And then someone... A weeping, red-eyed man with a broken spirit who smelt of Cinzano and death. <laughs> ...had to put them in alphabetical order by hand, spreading all the bits of paper out on the floor. Now, nowadays, putting things in alphabetical order takes about half a nanosecond, thanks to Windows 2010, featuring the Intel Pentium processor. Do, 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 do. <laughs> but back then, it took four years and was a skilled task, handed down from father to son. Yeah, and guess what? Every week, the enemy gig guide was wrong. And yet, it was, according to every reader survey conducted, the only thing that people bought the enemy for in the first place. <laughs> As a result, there are still people wandering this land in nomadic communities, listlessly knocking on the doors of pubs, clutching a tattered scrap of enemy. Yes? Is this where the gig is? There's no gigs here. But it says here, Super Tramp plus support. I can offer you warmth and shelter for the night and Thai food. You may laugh. I'm very glad you did. <laughs> you may laugh, but here is a true story about the power of the enemy gig guide. The year is 1986. No, it isn't. Not now it isn't. Thanks. The year was 1986. It's almost April. Was. Was almost April. And for an April Fool, wily enemy news editor Terry Staunton decides to insert a tiny lie into the already fairly inaccurate gig guide. <laughs> Crouching on the ground with his sheets of A4 paper, he writes, April the 1st, London Kilburn National Ballroom, The Pogues and Everything But The Girl. <laughs> An hilarious gag. Two unlikely bedfellows. And that's just everything but the girl. <laughs> what chance that this could be mistaken for a real gig? Obviously, come April the 1st, it's mistaken for a real gig. There were over a thousand people on the pavement outside. <laughs> Pogues fans demanding blood, everything but the girl fans demanding cappuccinos and free espadrilles. Ah, oh, the power of the rock press. There's more to the music press, though, than the gig guide. Writing about music is the ultimate interface between a writer and a musician. We'd like to demystify the process for you now. 
If you get a job on a music paper, the first real task you'll have to do is a live review. Very exciting for the young writer. And also very easy to spot the novice or tyro live reviewer at their first gig. Excuse me? Oh, sorry, did I knock you with my large yellow pad and special pen with a torchlight in the end? Yeah, you did, actually. Well, good, because I'm reviewing this, you know. This is the reviewer, though, on their second gig. Excuse me, I couldn't help noting you're scribbling on the back of a cigarette packet. You're not reviewing this for the NME or someone, are you? No. Why won't you people leave me alone? <laughs> and in truth, this is what a journalist is like six short months later. In 1986... I was commissioned by the NME to review three concerts in one week. The first concert was by the Fine Young Cannibals at London's Hammersmith Odeon. I got the date of the gig wrong and made up the whole review. <laughs> the second concert was Blue Oyster Cult, also at London's Hammersmith Odeon. I couldn't get enough tickets for my mates, so I sent them instead and I asked them to write down the names of all the songs and any funny things the band might say between songs. <laughs> the third concert was Elton John at London's Wembley Arena. Now, I can't stand Elton John, <laughs> but I was feeling a bit guilty by now, so I actually went to the gig. After three songs, one of which was I'm Still Standing, I could stand it no longer, <laughs> and fled screaming into the night, thereby reviewing three concerts in one week and only hearing three songs, <laughs> all of which were by Elton John. <laughs> I was sent to review the 1989 Reading Festival for the NME. Now, these days, the Reading Festival is about as anarchic as Time Team with Tony Robinson. <laughs> but back then, believe me, it was Dante's Thames Valley Inferno. All day long, I sat and watched while revolting barefoot hippie children called Gandalf and Placenta <laughs> set fire to people's sleeping bags until on the stroke of ten, as is customary, Local Hells Angels descended on the site and began urinating feverishly into empty plastic cider bottles, which they threw with force at the hapless Bonnie Tyler. <laughs> I could stand it no longer, and I fled into the night without seeing Jefferson Starship, the headline band. But I did throw in what I thought was a clever reference to them as I drove home listening to them on the radio. I said Grace Slick of Jefferson Starship had seen the horror and carnage of Altamont, the ill-fated Altamont Festival in the 60s. So I said she wasn't likely to be phased by a few greasers from Newbury. After my review appeared, a reader wrote to the enemy and said, yeah, good points to you, well made, but felt they should point out that Grace Slick had left Jefferson Starship <laughs> two and a half years <laughs> earlier. Now, on any normal paper, that would have got me the sack straight away, but not the enemy because the editor never bothered reading the paper. <laughs> Mind you, why should we as journalists put any effort into gigs? Because the bands don't. 1984, Aerosmith. Aerosmith are one of the biggest rock groups on the planet back then in the mid-80s, but they are living life to the full. I.e., they're on drugs all the time. But they're going to pull out all the stops for a homecoming show at the Boston Enormo Dome. Their tour manager looks at the set list they're uh, planning to play, and he says, well, you can't do this. It's the same set, song for song, in the same order that you did when you last played this festival four years ago. It's going to look like you're washed up. It's an insult to the fans. At least do them in a different order. It's not that obvious that way, is it? You know, you always end with Walk This Way. Why not start with Walk This Way? Hey, great idea, boss, they say. So the hour of the gig arrives, the house lights dim, Aerosmith run out on stage, and it's pandemonium. Hello, Boston! Yeah, you ready to rock? Oh, yeah, baby. Do you see what Aerosmith have done? They've played Walk This Way. They think they've finished. <laughs> they think they've been on stage two and a half hours. They've been on stage four minutes. <laughs> Sorry, lads. 18 more songs and the rubbishy ballad still to go. Oh, oh man. man. So, life on the road, it's tough. Reviewing gigs, though, simple. It's getting into the venue that's hard because if you're a paying punter, you just buy a ticket, give it in, in you go. Simple. But if you're reviewing the gig, you have to go through the mental torment of being on the guest list. Do we look like haunted men to you? Do we look like Vietnam veterans with thousand yard stare? That's because we've spent much of our adult life being on the guest list. Sounds cushy. 
isn't. No. Because here's what you think it's going to be like the first time you're on that guest list. You think that you'll approach the Hull Adelphi to the sounds of the Hallelujah Chorus. You imagine that there will be a throng some 30,000 strong from which a splinter group of nubile young women in star sailor t-shirts will rush forward looking at you in a mixture of devotional awe and sexual frenzy. They will carry you aloft to the gates of the venue, giving you to a uniformed doorman who will kiss you on the top of the head like a much-loved child and hand you to his colleague through a door marked guests. And he will place a laminated garland of plastic passes around your neck, rather like they do with flowers on arrival in Hawaii. Oh, why don't you tell them what it's really like? Steve Marconi? Your name's not down, you're not coming in. My name's not down, I'm not going in, what can I do next? My whole job depends on me getting into that gig, unless you're David, of course, and you've sent your friends. But you're out here on the pavement, and the tubby Mancunians, doves, are in there playing their hard sides. Well, here's some things you could try saying to the doorman, guaranteed not to get you in. Stand aside, fascist, I work for the enemy. Look, here's a copy I've brought with me, just to prove it. I am Mick Jagger. I'm really good friends with the band, actually. They'll vouch for me. They wrote this song about me and everything. It's called Merry Christmas, everybody. Did I say David Quantic? I meant Martin Amis. There I am. OK, so what's the holy grail of a rock journalist trying to get into a gig? Pass. Correct. The pass. But even this is more complicated than it sounds because nothing is black and white in the world of rock. Except the specials. Yes. <laughs> And passes, which come in the form of a sticker. Now, the sticker should be worn discreetly on the inside of the jacket, unless it's your first gig, of course, in which case it should be worn full on the forehead. <laughs> passes, you may notice, are colour-coded. That's in order to create a kind of feudal system within the freeloading community. Actually, the real feudal system of medieval Europe was itself based on colour-coded passes. Only they didn't stick on very well because they were made of hessian. <laughs> this led to all sorts of confusion. Here, can I see your pass, please? Oh, no, it must have fallen off near that hay cart over there, bloody Hessian. Well, it's landowners only past this point. Zounds. <laughs> Zounds. Zounds closed down years ago, mate. <laughs> anyway, it's all right, because I'm a knight. Uh, what's your name? Um, it's uh, Sir Andreas D. Collins of Northamptonium. According to my list, you've already gone in, look. Really? Mind freak. <laughs> Yeah, funny how I'm the only one here with a real West Country accent. <laughs> and I'm not in that sketch. I was dying to be in that sketch. Bet you were. No, what you really covet is this. The Access All Areas Pass. All music journalists remember their first Access All Areas Pass. This gets you, well, everywhere. Corridors, dressing rooms, cupboards the little office where they keep the pens, the side of the stage. You can always spot a journalist with their first ever Access All Areas pass. They're the one walking out onto the stage just as you two launch into where the streets have no name. There are, of course, important variations on the sticky pass. One is the wristband, very much de rigueur at festivals and open-air gigs. The only trouble is, you can't take it off afterwards and thus look for weeks afterwards as if you've escaped from a Dayglo mental hospital. <laughs> the other, though, is the plastic laminate, which you wear around your neck on a lanyard. A lanyard! It sounds like something you'd find on a pirate ship, doesn't it? <laughs> but it is actually just a bit of cord. However, this bit of cord, in combination with the plastic laminate, can get you backstage. 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 Backstage, as Jean Pitney said, the very word is redolent of excess and debauchery. It is the innermost of inner sanctums. Yes. Let us paint a picture for you now of what life is like backstage. You might imagine the band's dressing room to be a palatial suite decked out in good luck cards from Radiohead, a huge teddy bear from Richard Ashcroft, <laughs> little light bulbs round the mirrors and minions peeling grapes and uncorking champagne for all the visiting rock journalists. Oddly, it's not like that. No, let's consult our I Spy Book of Rock and turn to the section marked Backstage. You score five for any of the following and then go and tell Big Chief I Spy, who is a real Indian. Six small cans of Heineken in half an inch of water in a plastic dustbin. Check. A plate that once contained some Doritos. Check. An unnecessarily aggressive student union poster asking you not to use sexist language or flush the toilet. Check. A copy of last week's NME open at your bad review of the band with a big ring drawn round it. Check. The product manager from the Dutch record company whose name, improbably, is Johan Trouses. Check. The 
keyboard player's brother, Kev, who, who's in a band himself, actually. A bit doorsy, a bit flying burrito, brothers on acid. Here's a tape in case you're interested. Yeah, cheers. Check. A really pale girl with a poster. Check. Check. <laughs> well, it's now time to drag this week's very special guest star away from the lavish BBC backstage area. It is our old friend, Edwin Collins. And what are you going to do for us tonight? It's a song called Graciously. Fantastic. Edwin Collins. I've got a tiger in my tank I'll keep your picture neath the dashboard I've got a feeling in my bones but when I call you won't be home You'll be out there in the twilight Waiting for the night to fall Fall, fall You know you turn my world around And now I'm hanging upside down And if you just give me your key I would accept it graciously Graciously Him. You say you'll get there in the end There's some confusion in my mind As to what there is to find there Still I want you more than ever Though you make me feel so small Small Small, you know, you've turned my world around, and now I'm hanging upside down. And if you just give me your key. I would accept it graciously, graciously. Edwin Collins. When you go out on tour with a band for the first time, like Tiny Cameron Crow did in Almost Famous, you'll meet many exotic and colourful characters. Yes, like roadies, for instance. Yes, as their name gently hints, roadies are the road crew paid to move heavy equipment around all day and night, except when they're gaffer taping other naked roadies to groupies and putting them in the lift of the Nov Hotel Warrington. <laughs> roadies have a very special favourite tool, a maglite, named after the Belgian surrealist painter, René Maglite. <laughs> roadies also have two core beliefs. One is that bending down makes you invisible. Two, roadies believe that the best way to test a microphone is not to sing into it, but to say, one, two, one, two, one, two, two. <laughs> because of this, German band Kraftwerk are often mistaken for their own roadies. <laughs> but roadies are a bit like Germans in a way, aren't they? In that they have their own language. And they've also got beards, fat asses, and they travel extensively on the continent. <laughs> But roadie speak is a delightful and varied tongue. Yeah, here's some examples now of roadie speak with translations. Load out. Unload. Load in. Unload. Tear down. Unload. De-rig. Unload. De-rigger. Compulsory. 
Congratulations. You're going to all now ingratiate yourself with the road crew, which is handy when on the tour nobody else will talk to you, except for the product manager from the Dutch record company, whose name improbably is Johan Trousers. <laughs> OK, you're on the tour bus. It's sort of more like <laughs> Ooh, okay, a Robin Reliant than a tour bus. <laughs> <laughs> OK, you're riding the steel horse across the wide-open prairie of the United States of Rock, as John Bon Jovi would metaphorically have it. Yes, but John Bon Jovi does actually ride a steel horse. <laughs> so what is a tour bus like? Well, it's a silver cylinder of pure aluminium. Or if you come from a country where they find the newer sound a bit tricky, aluminum. <laughs> Outside, it's a gleaming space rocket. Inside, it's a shared student flat on wheels. <laughs> It's a parade of human depravity, the like of which has not been seen since the Mersey Water Board started policing their reservoirs properly. Anyway, here's the I Spy Guide again. Turn to the page marked things you'll find on the tour bus and score five for any of the following. Two 18-year-old girls who are frankly underdressed for November in Chicago. Check. The driver, who used to drive status quo around, and frankly, they were a much better laugh than this bunch of student tosses. Kid A! Kid A more like. Check. The video collection, which will always include Spinal Tap, the scariest porn film you have ever seen, a Canadian film about a young boy's sexual awakening set in the autumn, <laughs> the world's most extreme motorcycle crashes, and Nuts in May. Check. See, so you can also tell by the band's catchphrases what they're actually watching on the tour bus video, because if they keep saying, kiss prudence, then it's Nuts in May. But if their catchphrase is, and as the iron fist of the Third Reich closed around Stalingrad, then they're watching the Nazis, a warning from history. <laughs> and you're probably on tour with Motorhead. That was Ace of Spades, a snatch of the famous Motorhead live album, No Sleep Till Hammersmith. <laughs> you see, live concerts and records interface like two hands making a fleshy church and steeple in the form of the live album. Live albums are strange events. On the one hand, it's a way of conveying the excitement and unique atmosphere of a concert that a studio recording can never capture. On the other, it's like going to a gig with a giant wet sock on your head. This is because live albums are made under siege conditions. Not literally, of course. Making a live album of David Bowie's Station to Station tour didn't actually involve pouring cauldrons of boiling oil over Norman soldiers. That was the Glass Spider tour. <laughs> But it is very difficult to make a live album. Yes, but bands don't think so, because they're always going, hey, let's get back to our real sound, you know, the early days, guys, the club sound, the live sound, no overdubs, no remixes, no retakes, just our raw sound of rock. Bad idea. Very bad idea. Very, very bad idea, because doing that means you go from this... ...to this... Thus, a song that once sounded like luxury, imagination and romance all tied up in a glitzy package turns via the medium of the live record into, basically, old man Steptoe singing into a coal scuttle. <laughs> so what's a band to do? Well, firstly, they try and rectify the horrible mistake they make. Instead of no overdubs, no remixes, no retakes, they give the tapes to Fat Boy Slim and he puts on overdubs, remixes and retakes so that this... is turned into this. Of course, some bands are so great that they needn't rely on technology and trickery in the studio. This is because they rely on technology and trickery on stage. Here, for example, is a recent Westlife single. And here is a live version of that single. That is Swear Again from Westlife's forthcoming live album, Unleashed and Dangerous. We have come for your children. <laughs> Two more things the budding rock hack should know about live albums. One, you can always tell American live albums from British ones because American live albums have always got some dimwit whooping during the quiet bits. <laughs> Oh yeah, and two, when reviewing a live album, be careful about the title. For years, I thought The Who came from Yorkshire. Because of their album, The Who Live It Leads. <laughs> a couple more tips on gigs. The best place to stand at a gig if you're a fan to achieve optimal aural effectiveness 
is to stand behind the mixing desk. Now, the mixing desk is the big thing in the middle of the hall with a fence and a drug-faced hippie in glasses on the inside. <laughs> now, this hippie's name is Akko, and he is the sound man. The sound man mixes the band's live sound, and so the best place to stand at a gig is by the mixing desk. But the best place to stand at a gig, if you're a rock journalist, is by the bar. <laughs> the bar is the big thing at the back of the hall where a wide range of alcoholic drinks and hot pies are served. <laughs> Standing at the bar may mean that you can't see or hear the band very well, but frankly, if it's the ninth time you've seen Ocean Colour Scene, that can be a blessing. <laughs> Plus, you can ask all the other rock journalists what the name of the last song was without having to shout. One of the very strangest things that bands are entitled to under the laws of rock... The laws, the laws of, of rock! rock is the rider. Now, a rider is an additional clause in their contract as part of their agreement to play a gig. Food, drink and fags, basically, served in the dressing room on a trestle table, hence the famous Doors song, Riders on the Trestle Table. <laughs> Riders on the trestle table. <laughs> Stuart McConey there. <laughs> <laughs> the most famous rider story of all time is the Van Halen M&M's story. Legend has it that the sun-bleached Californian rockers would demand a big bowl of M&M's in the dressing room at each gig, but with the brown ones taken out by hand. Now, one theory is that this stipulation was there purely to check that the tour promoters were paying attention to the exact wording of their rider. Another theory is that Van Halen were a bunch of silly bastards. <laughs> Riders tell you a lot about the band in question. For instance, here's a typical rider for the self-styled US rock wild man, Ted Nugent. One ox, living. <laughs> one gallon of wild turkey. One wild turkey. <laughs> and here is Suzanne Vegas. One loaf of vegan multi bread. One big wooden bottle of mm, malicious pond water. <laughs> One really nice book about sea anemones. <laughs> also, the novice or Tyro Rock journalist is advised to learn rider etiquette. Rule one, don't take anything unless you're invited to, even a peanut off the floor. Rule two, you can take something if it's offered, but don't go mad. If Bono from 80s band U2 says... <laughs> If Bono from 80s band U2 says, Help yourselves, me laddio. It all comes off the old VAT, don't you know? <laughs> A, he's probably not Bono. <laughs> or even Irish. <laughs> and B, what he really means is, Have a glass of Shiraz, why don't you? Or a banana. What he doesn't mean is, Stride over to the table, Push the edge or Larry Grayson or whatever he's called to the floor, <laughs> And start drinking vodka from the bottle. Rule three, don't take something even if you are offered unless it's offered by someone important. If, for example, you're backstage with the Pet Shop Boys and Neil Tennant says, we're all going to dive head first into this jacuzzi full of creme de menthe, that's all right. But if it's one of the androgynous dancers who pretends to be a puma during It's a Sin, then think <laughs> twice. I wish I had. <laughs> Which brings us to the end of touring. The end of touring. The video age when life-size rock stars Little Tom York and Keith Richard will dance holographically on our own coffee tables. No, Stuart. Just the end of this bit of the show. They can't do any of those things yet. Yeah, that's what they want you to think, Dave. Thank you very much for your patience, Cleveland. Lloyd Cole knew our father. Good night. Lloyd Cole Knew My Father was written and performed by Andrew Collins, Stuart McConey and David Quantin, with special guests Amelia Bullmore and Edwin Collins. The producer was Lucy Armitage. They're all down the 88 to 90. Playing this game.